All right, good morning, everyone. Let me see if I can get my timer to start here. All right, good. Um, so welcome. Thank you all for being here. Um, if you're in the back, there's definitely you know, chairs available if you want to integrate into the audience. Um, we're very excited for the symposium that we have today on aging with CF. What an exciting time that we're able to talk about that uh, more and more in this conference. Uh, really a, a testament to the progress that's been made. Um, so I'm going to do a very brief introduction, and then I will get out of the way so our uh, speakers can talk. Um, maybe, if I can advance the slide. Let's try this. There we go. All right, so my name is Chris Drescher. I'm an associate professor uh, from Augusta University, and um, I'm one of the co-chairs for the present, uh, presentation today, and I do have some research funding from Boomer Esiason Foundation. Just a quick intro on what we're going to be talking about today. Um, we have seen a sustained increase in life expectancy in people with CF. Um, as of 2019, people uh, born between 2015 and 2019 have a predicted life expectancy of 46 years. Of course, with the uh, addition of Trikafta, we're likely to see even more pronounced uptick in life expectancy for individuals with CF. And uh, this increasing life expectancy brings new hopes, challenges, and opportunities for individuals with CF, their families, and their healthcare teams. Our speakers are going to focus on four different facets of aging with CF and how we, as members of their healthcare teams, can help our clients plan, survive, and thrive. Um, what we hope to accomplish today is to describe uh, the physical, psychological, and social issues related to aging that are relevant to patients with cystic fibrosis and their families. Um, explain strategies to support health and overall well-being of older patients with cystic fibrosis. And then we will summarize key points to be aware of as life expectancy in patients with CF continues to increase. Uh, for the session, we are going to hold all of our questions until the end. And we will ask that you please submit your questions through the app. Hopefully, um, you're familiar with that. If you go to our session in the app, there should be a Q&A button where you're able to enter uh, your questions. And we'll do our best to monitor those. Please note that there is a different tab that says Discussion. That's more for just sort of talking about what's going on, if you want to, amongst yourselves. But the Q&A tab is where we'll be pulling the questions from. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and introduce all of our speakers for today, and then uh, let them each come up and, and uh, give their talks. So first, we will have uh, Dr. Richard Simon. He's Professor Emeritus of Eternal Medicine from the University of Michigan. And he'll be talking about CF, common comorbidities, and aging. Our second talk is going to be from Karen Carey, who is a senior specialist in health system innovation and navigation at Compass. And she's going to be talking about planning for a secure future, retirement, health insurance, and financial stability. For our third presentation, we're going to have uh, two speakers, uh, Dr. Lisa Scheer from Stanford, uh, who's a director of psychiatric and psychological services for the adult CF program there and Leslie Miller, who's a medical social worker and mental health coordinator at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. And then our last talk will be from Dr. Virginia O'Hare, uh, who is the director of the Jefferson, City Clinic, uh, Jefferson Center City Clinic uh, for Behavioral Medicine at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital. She'll be presenting on emotional well-being, finding meaning and purpose. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to welcome Dr. Simon. Thank you. It's really my pleasure to be here. I sort of view this talk as a normal evolution of a talk that I gave back 14 years ago in a plenary session. And as you'll see as I end this, you'll see the linkage between the two talks. So, and this is not advancing with that, so it's not advancing. Thank you. Yep, so I have nothing to report here. 
I'm going to begin with a case presentation. And this is an adult male with CF diagnosed at four months of age, has two severe CFTR mutations, mild pulmonary symptoms, cough and sputum production, and really very well-preserved FEV1. It's actually above predicted 120%. But he does carry two known CF pathogens, MRSA and Pseudomonas. He's pancreatic insufficient, but he has a good nutritional status with a good BMI. And so you may ask, why did I choose this particular patient to present? You know, for any of you who see adults with cystic fibrosis, this is very typical. So why did I choose this individual rather than others to, to present? And the answer is, this individual is 73 years old. He's married, has a master of science degree. He, is, he owns a software company. He's retired. And the point I'm making now is that aging and cystic fibrosis is not unique. We've been seeing it for a while. In fact, you can look at the data from the CF registry looking at the age distribution of people with CF, and these are data from 2020, and over 1,800 people were over the age of 50. That's 6% of those. So we have seen people getting older with cystic fibrosis for a while. So what's changed to make this such a hot topic? Why are you all here today? Why am I standing here? And of course, the answer is obvious. It's the approval of Alexacaster, Tezacaster, Ibacaster, triple combination in 2019, because this really changed things. We've all known since really the early reports of the clinical trials that there was substantial improvement in lung function, well-being, and a number of other parameters. But initially, we weren't sure how this was going to impact survival. And in fact, it's had a significant impact. These are data also from the CF registry, but I'm, a, I'm a demonstrating them by each year, not the rolling average of what they typically show in the registry. And you can see that in 2019, the median predicted survival was steadily increasing, as you can see, over many years at 48 years. But the first full year of trikafta use, it went up to 59. And I've give, been given a preview of the data from 2021 that's going to be put out. And we're up to 65.6. This is huge. This is unbelievable. And this is why everyone's here today to try to figure out how are we going to take care of these patients where there's going to be so many that are aging. So I am going to uh, be breaking this up into several different uh, topics. I'm going to look at the types of challenges due to aging in CF, the well-known complications of CF, what happens as you get older, some adverse consequences of a CF treatment in particular, and problems that are confronted by all people as they age and how CF impacts that. So as far as the well-known complications of CF, there's obviously the issue of progression of lung disease. And traditionally, the, much of the work that we've done as clinicians has been directed toward trying to minimize the impact of the lung disease, and this will continue. Um, we still know that at least with Ivacaftor and patients with gating mutations, that there still is a more rapid deterioration in lung function than is normal, although it's probably, it's much improved over without the highly effective therapy. We always have to remember that they're not everyone is eligible for modulator therapy, and so these individuals are going to still be following the same pathway, and we're going to need to, as they get older, they're going to have more burden of lung disease as well. I'm going to talk about CF-related diabetes, bone disease, and C cancer in people with CF. Now, these are the data from 2020 of uh, the prevalence of cystic fibrosis-related diabetes in uh, the CF registry here. And you can see that once you're adult, it's between 20 and 40 percent. It bounces around a little bit. And so what happens as people age who have CF-related diabetes? Well, we can look at the complications of diabetes in the general population, the non-CF population. And generally, you can break those different complications down into two different groups the microvascular disease and the macrovascular disease. The microvascular disease is disease, the retinopathy, problems with the eyes, nephropathy, neuropathy. And then in the macrovascular disease, it's heart disease, particularly coronary artery disease, and stroke and peripheral vascular disease. 
So this is what happens in, in the general population who have type 1 or type 2 diabetes. And we know that these complications tend to become more prevalent and they actually worsen the more time from when you were diagnosed with having cystic fibrosis. So what is the situation that we know now in people with cystic fibrosis? Well, we've had patients who are now old enough who have had their diabetes, CF-related diabetes, long enough to know that they do get the retinopathy, nephropathy, and neuropathy. And so we really have to address this. But for some reason, it appears that the macrovascular disease is rarely reported in patients with cystic fibrosis, although there are case reports we contributed one of those to that. And that, so that it appears that at least as of now, there's some relative protection against the heart disease, stroke, and peripheral vascular disease that would otherwise occur in type 1 or type 2 diabetes there. So what is the impact of highly effective modular therapy on CF-related diabetes? Well, we're just beginning to accumulate this data, but it appears that glucose control is improved, particularly in people with milder levels, and we're going to hear much more about this as more data comes in. But the question is, will increasing CFTR function by these modulators, you know, how will that address the causes of CF-related um, you know, diabetes? And we really don't know that. There are some reasons you could believe that it would lessen the frequency of it because if, in fact, it is CFTR um, lack of function, that you now are making it better with modulators, so we just don't know that. But the strategies that we'll have to use, at least as of now going forward, as we're seeing our population age, is to still emphasize early diagnosis and early treated to avoid hyperglycemia because we do know that in type 1 and type 2 diabetes, that if you keep the patients from having really high blood sugars, you will slow the progression of microvascular disease, which will be important as we're seeing our patients with CF, with CF-related diabetes age. As far as CF-related bone disease, and that's predominantly osteoporosis, um, uh, you can see that the frequency, at least according to the, or the prevalence according to this uh, registry data, continues to go up with older age groups. And with this, how do we approach it? Well, we really, again, don't know the effects of highly effective modulator therapy on the development and progression of osteoporosis there. Um, this is a condition that occurs very slowly, loss of bone occurs over many years, and so even if we're going to have a significant, oops, a, a significant effect from this, um, it'll take some time to show up. So the strategies to limit it as we're getting our population, you know, aging, is to optimize nutrition, make sure adequate calcium intake, vitamin D needs to be there in order to maintain healthy bones, exercise, weight bearing particularly, and then screening to see those who are losing bone density faster than they should into treating it. I've put asterisks on a few of these because this, these are probably going to be impacted by highly effective modulator therapy. We all know that nutrition improves when patients can digest better with, um, with highly effective therapy. And there's an early report that vitamin D absorption is better and that patients are less likely to be as severely vitamin D deficient. My hope is that with better preserved lung function that our patients will exercise more and that there, that would be also beneficial of limiting osteoporosis. Um, so the next topic is cancer rate, and I'm going to start out by talking just really about bowel cancer because that's the type of cancer that's most prevalent in people with CF prematurely, although there are other types of cancers that can occur more frequently as well. These are data from a U.S. surveillance. This is looking at the general population, and you can see that the frequency of GI cancer, bowel cancer, increases beginning around age 40 and going up with that. And that um, if you then look at the frequency of, um, of bowel cancer in patients with cystic fibrosis, you can see it goes up much quicker and to higher levels there. So this will be a significant problem that we'll need addressing as patients with CF age, because as they get older, they are more likely to develop um, bowel cancers and a few other cancers as well. 
But the, the cause of GI cancers, why it's increased in CF, we're not certain. There's a number of different hypotheses, including chronic inflammation of the GI tract that is known to occur. But also, there is now more evidence that the CF gene itself, the CFTR gene, is a cancer-suppressing gene, it's cancer-suppressing function. And so that if you don't have adequate CFTR, you lose that suppressive function, and that can increase then cancer incidence. And again, we don't know the effect of CFTR modulators on this. If they suppress chronic inflammation and if they return this cancer suppressing function, perhaps the frequency will decrease as we hope it will. The, strat the good news is that at least for, um, for colorectal cancer, that we already have a good answer to that, but it requires us to be able to screen large numbers of the population of the CF uh, patients to make sure that early changes are picked up at this stage of polyps that can be removed and you can avoid progressing to full cancer. But, there's, uh, but this is a test right now that depends on colonoscopy. There's other options that are becoming available. But getting people to adhere to these recommendations has been difficult. As far as challenges, uh, challenges of aging, I'm going to just mention one problem of an adverse effect from CF treatment, and that's the problem that occurs with using one of our antibiotics, tobramycin. Now, tobramycin is used to treat pulmonary exacerbations in people who have Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And it's well known that the IV, not inhaled so much, but IV use of tobramycin can cause problems and reduce kidney function, cause problems with the ear that's decreased hearing and decreased balance as well. Um, we do a lot to try to avoid this, but that is, this still occurs. We're not really certain whether or not we need two antibiotics to treat um, pseudomonas during pulmonary exacerbations. And in fact, we're lucky that a study is going to start very shortly to see whether IV tobramycin needs to be added to a second IV antibiotic when treating people with pseudomonas. And that's a STOP360, the aminoglycoside study. It's still going to be a few years, but we do have to be careful treating patients now that we know they're going to last into their 60s, 70s, and beyond. That, they, that we don't accrue organ damage that was less significant if people weren't going to make it past earlier um, ages. So. Um, so the challenges of aging, um, just in general, how does CF affect that? So these are the leading causes of death in the United States of all people in 2020. And you can see heart disease at the top. And because this is at the top, I'm going to spend the rest of my time pretty much talking about the effects of CF on heart disease, and also the effects of highly effective therapy. This is looking at data, again, from the general population, showing that heart disease begins to increase significantly in the 50s, and it goes up significantly as you get older there. And so the question is, what does having CF do to affect this? Well, we can look at the main risk factors for cardiovascular disease in the general population, excuse me, in the general population. And for um, people in general, these are the highest risk factors for premature development of cardiovascular disease. And they include smoking, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, obesity, an unhealthy diet, and physical inactivity. So how are these risk factors influenced by having cystic fibrosis? Well, my hope is that by having cystic fibrosis, that fewer people with cystic fibrosis smoke, so that would tend to decrease the frequency of cardiovascular disease. Having CF by itself doesn't seem to affect high um, blood pressure and is not a cause for elevated. We know that with people with cystic fibrosis, particularly those who have problems with absorption, that their cholesterol is low, not high, so this would tend to protect them from cardiovascular disease. I already talked about the uncertainty of with di CF-related diabetes in that it seems to uh, not have a great effect on macrovascular disease as other types of diabetes have. Um, up until recently, the frequency of obesity in CF was really quite low, so that would also protect them from that. But they do have a, what would be considered from a heart standpoint an unhealthy diet, eating high-carbohydrate, high-fat diets. And my hope is that, you know, that, you know we, excuse me, with, with cystic fibrosis, 
people's ability to do physical activity is less with more lung disease, so that would tend to increase their physical inactivity there. So what I want to do is spend just a minute on this one topic of obesity, because this is changing with highly effective therapy. These are data that were re very recently reported, and it shows the trend over the last 20 years, what's happening to body weight in people with cystic fibrosis based on the CF registry. And you can see here that the good news is, in blue here is those individuals that were underweight, and you can see as time went on that they decreased uh, significantly. But at the same time, those who are overweight and those who are obese has increased significantly compared to what they were previously. So this protection from cardiovascular disease by a low frequency of obesity may in fact be not, not, not as present. And what is the effect of highly effective modulator therapy on body weight? Well, there's a recent report that looked at patients' weight prior to and then during the year after beginning highly effective therapy. The good news is that in this study, the number of underweight went down pre and post. But can you see those that just in one year, the percent that were overweight and obese went up. So it's possible that with highly effective therapy, with increasing levels of weight and particularly obesity, that this will have an adverse effect on, on, on cardiovascular health. And I just picked out one other slide from, adapted it from this paper, looking at the effects of highly effective therapy on blood pressure. And as you can see here, pre and post, the number of people with normal blood pressure drop, and people with significant stages of, hyper, of hypertension actually increased. So it may be that highly effective therapy may actually add a slightly to cardiovascular risk by having this burden here. So if we look at the effects of modulator therapy across the board, hopefully people with better lung disease won't start smoking. But there is an issue of increased blood pressure, increased cholesterol, question mark on the diabetes, the obesity. And my hope is that physical inactivity will go down as they have better lung function. Okay? So, but there is concern, and this is a recent uh, uh, communication correspondence that was just published by Druckers and, and colleagues. And what they did is they took a calculator that takes people's characteristics in the general population, plugs them in, it's like age, um, sex, it's um, you know, uh, weight, cholesterol levels, blood pressure, et cetera, and then calculates what their cardiovascular risk is. And what these authors did is they took from their population of CF patients, they plugged it into this um, calculator and just ignoring the things I've said about perhaps diabetes not being an issue and things like that, they found that it looked like there was a lot of cardiovascular risk from their patient population. And so as they aged, this was very concerning to them. And so that's why they came up with the title of this, uh, this correspondence. So, okay. So the good news is that we can address this. The, um, we, we've got good guidelines for how to limit the effects of all these risk factors to maintain good cardiovascular function. So in the last two slides, I just want to sort of circle back to what I sort of uh, um, mentioned previously. So back in 2008, I was lucky enough to be asked to participate in a plenary session. And this was looking at the extremes of age, Phil Farrell was presenting on the effects of newborn screening on maintaining health, and I was asked to give a, uh, the talk on healthy aging with improved adult care. This was at a time when we were still having troubles of, um, developing adult CF programs, um, and so that the level of care in adults varied considerably from center to center. And my talk was designed to sort of motivate what the challenges were now that we were no longer a pediatric disease and we were now both a pediatric and an adult disease, what those challenges are. But I could see, foresee the future here. And so what I actually did at the end of this talk, um, I actually, using Photoshop, I made up a fictitious um, short course for a future North American meeting. And so I, I'm a little bit off. I predicted it would be 10 years later here. But this is the title I chose. I wanted a short course on how we could strengthen geriatric care in this field. And here we are today, and I couldn't be happier. Thank you.
Karen Carey, if you'd like to come on up, you're going to be next. Well, hi everyone. I am. Uh, I'm so excited to be here, and I, I really love that uh, that crystal ball that you have, Dr. Simon. I um, I'm Karen Carey. Um, I am a senior specialist within health system innovation and navigation at the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. My pronouns are she, her, um, and I have no relationships to disclose related to this presentation. You know, before joining the health system team in 2021, I was a senior Compass case manager. Um, and in that role, I heard from an unforgettable caller who painted the vivid picture for me of the many hoops you have to jump through when living with CF. And then come the hoops that are on fire. Um, so as we are thinking about this road stretching out further and further ahead for some people, up come those, um, those hoops more and more, a whole new crop. Um, so it's my privilege today to join the conversation um, about aging with CF and talk about some of the logistics that might be needed for navigating those hoops. So for anybody who doesn't know, Compass is that personalized resource uh, for people living with CF, including those post-transplant, that helps them navigate insurance, legal, financial, and other challenges. Um, there's never any cost for working with Compass, um, and it is available without income criteria, insurance criteria, or even care center affiliation criteria. So when Compass was first approached about this topic, we uh, took a simple question to the Compass Advisory Board. When we talk about aging with CF, what are we talking about exactly? Um, now, the Compass Advisory Board uh, consists of adults living with CF, also some clinicians. There are uh, caregivers as well, and a number of CF Foundation uh, teammates from various departments. And here's what they said in a virtual discussion that we had. I'm curious what resonates with you on that. Because um, for me, there is a common thread that ties something like surviving to thriving, something that ties having a family, having a career, retiring from that career, to health insurance. And that's the concept here of financial wellness. So when I say financial wellness, I'm talking specifically about steps that are required to um, go with, um, manage basic needs, cope with unexpected costs, and importantly, plan for the future. Um, so I'm sure this is a working definition. Um, it builds on our internal uh, processes to try to define wellness overall, but also um, on some external resources. And importantly for us, at least, it went through a review um, with people living with CF as well. Um, so here, it, uh, it's really about this idea of, of financial wellness in total. Um, the things that I think are really important to point out, you know, members of the CF community don't constitute a monolithic group. And this concept of economic stability, which we'll touch on in just a second, doesn't look the same for everyone. So I have a few quotes to share with you from members of the Compass Advisory Board. And given all that, I still think that you um, will see something familiar in some of these quotes. So it's concerns here about the cost of everything. The idea of just getting ahead and then ending up in the hospital. Or this one, where they didn't anticipate what was going on in the road ahead, and so haven't saved money, and then feel behind. So we learned something else that was really critical about financial wellness. And I think that this quote on the screen here from another member of the Compass Advisory Board puts it really well. When we're talking about something conceptual, financial wellness, we're talking about something lived as well. And it's not just a box you can check, right? It's not a destination you show up to one day and can stay. Um, it's fluid and changes, and changes with one's uh, disease burden, but also it's applicable to everyone with CF at any stage of CF. So in 2021, we underwent a financial wellness landscape analysis, and we had a lot of questions to start. I mean, it's the idea, what are, get, what are we talking about? So that working definition. Um, but then we also tried to learn about measures, and this is really hard because these are personal, intimate details, and how do you quantify that sort of lived experience? 
Um, but we also did internal and external benchmarking, look at, looking at who else is talking about this and how and what's coming from those conversations. Um, and where we are now is deep into this exploration of resources, what are the gaps, are there opportunities, um, and just speaking to this paradigm shift that you all are thinking of as well about living longer with CF. So with the definition established for financial wellness, then came this idea of, well, where is it in the bigger picture? And here we're talking about social determinants of health. So quick check, SDOH are the conditions in which we are born, we live, we work, and we age. So you'll notice there that economic stability is that uh, fifth of the circle there. Um, and importantly, when we talk about social risk factors, or when we talk about social determinants of health, those are neither positive nor negative. It's the social risk factors that are the adverse conditions and can contribute to poorer health. So in that big piece of economic stability pie, what we're talking about when it comes to social risk factors is things like food insecurity, housing insecurity, inability to pay for expenses, think medical bills. Now, the financial disease burden, um, or the disease burden of CF was explored thoroughly through the 2019 health insurance study. This was a CF Foundation funded study with George Washington University. Um, and we, uh, we know that um, this was 2019 that this data was collected, July to December, and there have been a couple things that have happened since then. Um, but the idea here is that um, we can see the takeaway from these and the story that it tells that paying for healthcare is challenging and there's not much financial room to spare. And for some, none at all. Um, so I think, again, the, the takeaway that we can um, pull from this data um, from 2019 is that what it means to thrive and the steps that are required to try are highly individualized. So from the health insurance study, a number of issue briefs were published by the authors that you'll see on the screen here. And um, you know these are exploring that connection between the social uh, risk factors and CF as well. And again, I think the important takeaways here is that it is hard to meet basic needs for a huge portion of our community. And further, income alone is not the only indicator of financial wellness. So again, we turn to the Compass Advisory Board. And again, I think that what they have written about some of the concerns they have for the future or challenges that they're facing today won't be unfamiliar to you. It's just a few examples on the screen here. So whether a person with CF is trying to meet basic needs, triage the unexpected, or plan for the future, it's important to talk about priorities. And with our many thanks to our PEP facilitators and colleagues, here are a few open-ended questions uh, to start that conversation. Now, quick check on that acronym. PEP is the Partnership Enhancement Program, which focuses on relationship-centered conversations. And I'm curious here, what sticks with you in terms of these questions? What do you feel you could actually ask somebody? The thing that these examples illustrate are those broader principles of PEP that you have to maintain the relationship. Right? But also, you have to normalize some of those conversations that can be really hard to have. And we know they're hard because of those vulnerabilities that could be associated with them. Uh, thinking about fear of judgment as an example. Um, they're also hard, though, because what I might think is priority could be completely different from the person on the opposite end of that conversation. So if you would like more information about PEP, the, um, the email is there. And there was that short course on yesterday. So quick reminder here about Compass Services. So Compass case managers help in that resource and information uh, navigation. So we can also help with um, insurance questions, whether that's finding insurance, whether that is troubleshooting issues that arise, and getting connected to those resources um, that are so critically important. And this is a look at the typical Compass case process for a fairly common uh, case, such as affording a CF treatment. You know, it can start with a review of an entire drug list, going point by point, checking for insurance coverage. Then come the referrals to the appropriate resources that might help um, in affording that medication or treatment. Um, and then looking, importantly, at additional resources that might help a family free up room in their budget. 
Now, that dotted line there you'll see is the standing offer from Compass to navigate the health insurance, right? So whether that is looking at options in an open enrollment period, a special enrollment period when somebody goes through a life change, or even just understanding the basics of a, their current health plan, I think the key there is that the details matter and Compass case managers can, uh, can help with that. So we took a look at Compass data, and from 2021, about the 4,400 plus inquiries that Compass case managers fielded, we found that about 77% fell within one of these categories for financial wellness, so meeting basic needs, unexpected costs, or planning for the future. And some things that stick out to me when I look at this data, interestingly, that transportation inquiry includes both medically related and non-medically related transportation. Also things like car repair or car purchase. And in that unexpected column, you'll see medical slash hospital expenses. So this includes something like a hospitalization, but it also includes something that you might typically think would be more expected, like a clinic visit. And the reason that they're lumped together in that unexpected category is because of that common connection between economic stability and health insurance and access. So again, the details matter uh, because it can help an individual feel prepared. So another look here at Compass calls uh, with regard to Medicare Part D enrollment from those 50 plus. So looking back at that slide from Dr. Simon, thinking about that large percentage of folks there. A really important thing to note for this 2022 data, that's the first eight months of the year. Ask any Compass case manager what comes in the last four months and what makes it so special, and that's open enrollment, including Medicare. And I want to pause for a second just thinking about this, this incredible trend, so from people 50 or older, and thinking about the complexity of those questions as the person calling ages. So someone who has had more time in the workforce, so has higher SSDI payments, somebody who might be thinking about Medicare and retirement, somebody who's thinking about the cost of their treatment for years to come, There's another important uh, data trend that we wanted to spotlight today, which is the calls to Compass about people coming, or from people coming off disability or having questions about coming off disability. And this is by age here. So you can see that over the past couple of years, Compass has had a dramatic increase in the number of calls from people 21 and over with questions about coming off disability. And whether that uh, disability determination was their pathway to Medicaid or perhaps they're already on Medicare, the critical thing to acknowledge with this type of call, again, thinking about the complexities, is that these are questions about both income and insurance. And another little bit of data here, um, 2022 calls this time um, from members of the CF community in some really interesting uh, categories. So we've got uh, people thinking about financial planning, scholarships from those over 22, um, and child care. So it's the adult living with CF calling about child care options uh, for their children. Uh, now, I'll just say that the number of these calls could be relatively low with the exception of scholarship. There might be very few calls, in fact, about child care. But I think that what we're, um, what we're seeing here is that, um, that really exciting conversation. Maybe it's about living longer, yes, but it's also about the quality of life on that road ahead, and people with CF calling Compass about that. So going back um, real quick to the health insurance study, this is a bit of data that always sticks with me, and it was 65% of respondents said that insurance impacted their major life decisions. So with that comes the balancing act of our show today. It's the idea that in looking for resources uh, for people living with CF, there are both uh, reactive and proactive strategies. And it is the idea here that as people with CF age, the life changes that they will go through increase. And there is a connection to be made between those life changes that happen outside of clinic and health insurance proactively. So before anybody runs for the door at another mention of understanding insurance, I introduce you to the Health Insurance Index. So this was a tool that was created through the Social Determinants of Health Toolkit, which I'll touch on in just a sec. Um, but it is really meant to be a guide for clinicians in helping you understand 
health insurance a little bit better as you help navigate people with CF through some of these major life decisions. Um, importantly, you always have Compass to call, but here is a resource just for you. It lives on the my.cff portal in the resource library. The QR code worked yesterday. Hopefully it works today. So what's a conversation about aging without a special shout out to, uh, to Medicare? Um, you know, Medicare is a complex program and uh, the out-of-pocket costs for people with CF can be significant. So this really underscores the need to uh, prepare for the transition. Um, here you've got a number of frequently asked questions that can help in that preparation. And you'll see that these are questions about affordability, these are questions about available resources and also additional options. Um, so again, some, some food for thought here. Now, if you're confused about Medicare, you're definitely not alone. Uh, the uh, Medicare Guide for Clinicians is again another resource that is available to you on the portal in that resource library. Uh, in particular, if you have questions about how CF care is covered, this is a really terrific resource. And the timely point to bring up about Medicare and the financial implications of being on Medicare for a person with CF is that 2022 Inflation Reduction Act. So there were two key considerations that were um, important for people living with CF in that act. And the first is limiting the annual Medicare Part D, as in drug, out-of-pocket costs. Now this won't start until 2025, but the reason that this is so significant is that under current Medicare structure, Part D has no cap. So people with CF are required to pay thousands out of pocket. The other implication will start sooner, 2023, with a cap on uh, insulin per month for Medicare enrollees. And this is particularly important for those managing CF-related diabetes. So that social determinants of health toolkit that I mentioned, this was a, a year-long process that um, involved clinicians as well as CFF staff and members of the CF community who uh, provided some critical review for us. Um, but it is again available on the portal. And what we're talking about here is definitions and language, but also cited research to make that connection between social risk factors and CF. And there are tools for clinicians as well as handouts for uh, people living with CF as well. Again, hopefully that QR code works. So just ending quick with a final conversation that we took to our Compass Advisory Board. We asked, you know, what are you celebrating? What are some things to look forward to? And we heard some incredible stories. You know, we're talking here about less time in the hospital, more time doing what I love, seeing people with CF pursue their dreams. I mean, I know that you all have your own data points for uh, this one in your day-to-day -day lives. Um, and I know that I don't need to tell you how motivational this is as we think about those steps that will be required to survive and thrive. And that's for today and in the future. So just a special thanks here to um, those listed on the screen, especially my HSIN and, uh, and Compass colleagues, and to all of you who are uh, involved in this really critical uh, conversation. I appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. I invite <clears throat> Dr. Cher up here to start our next presentation. Okay. Thank you so much for being here. Okay, just making sure, right? Okay. Just clicking on that is what's advancing. Okay. Okay, got it. Okay, great. So I'm Lisa Shea, I'm a psychiatrist embedded in our adult CF program at Stanford. Uh, and it's been definitely a very exciting time to be there, right, and noticing all the amazing developments and all the changes that our patients have experienced and we along with them with recent advancements. At Stanford, and I'm sure you have experienced that as well, we've had like a tremendous baby boom recently. So now we have so many, you know, young mothers Right, with little babies you know, who are being brought to our office, and it's just really amazing to see all those changes. So I will be focusing more on the mental health, psychosocial mental health concerns, kind of as people age, and then I will pass it on to Leslie, who will talk more about the grief and the loss and grief. Okay. 
both uh, myself and Leslie have uh, grants from CF Foundation. Great. So this slide actually builds up on what already has been said in this presentation, right? So as we just think about the psychosocial and existential burdens of our patients aging with CF, this is just some of the developments and ideas that, that, that we can witness. So of course we have additional and evolving comorbidities in our people with CF, right, as we see them age, and some previously uncharted. You know, we see more patients with dementias and neurodegenerative uh, uh, conditions, and I will actually have a case presentation later, later in, in, in my presentation, just to sort of see how CF and, for example, Parkinson's can correspond, right, and influence each other. So this is really something, I think, unique developing. Pa patients have increasing burden of medications, treatments, and doctor appointments. Again, with Trikafta and all those developments, we will see how all of this changes. But so far, our aging patients as of today, when we see them, many of them do have more medications, more doctor appointments, and it's really more than our full-time job taking care of themselves and running between the appointments and trying to coordinate. They also might be taking care of their now ailing parents and partners, as we've discussed. Now they become caregivers, right? So how does it, you know, you're taking care of yourself, and now you're taking care of somebody else who is ailing, if you're able. And they might have now decreased support network, right? So whatever networks they've had, now they're losing parents, their children are moving away, they lose the work connections if they worked before, they might lose their partners. And as we already discussed, right, a lot of our patients right now, we, we do hear that from them, they might not have plans as, you know, to, come, to come along so far. And again, those financial concerns that are really difficult, that we definitely had a great presentation on earlier. Survivor's guilt, right, having outlived their siblings, their friends, and all the feelings that come up along with that. But at the same time, of course, right, this is an exciting time. And our patients appreciate how far the research and clinical care of CF have come. So it's really gratifying for them to see this progress and appreciate the new treatments that especially younger populations are benefiting from and seeing the different trajectory, right, for younger populations. And of course, at the same time, also benefiting from the newer treatments and becoming mentors to younger populations. Uh, you know, during the, during the pandemic, I, you know, I was very lucky to actually um, to, to, to come moderate one of the kind of COVID groups through CFRI for our CF community. And it was actually incredible to see some of the older people with CF really connected, connecting with some of the young persons and teaching them. And it's really, those are meaningful connections, right? Now talking across the generations and passing down wisdom. And we will see that more and more. And it's really, those are really meaningful connections that we see developing. And there is ongoing importance of mental health. Right? Of course, depression and anxiety continue. I am also very curious to see, for example, how Trikafta is going to change or not change right, the rate of depression and anxiety. We do know that people with CF do have two to three times uh, increased risk of having depression and anxiety. And in general, all the people necessarily, kind of in general population, might not have increased risk of anxiety and depression, but people who are medically ill do have increased risk of depression and anxiety. And we know that depression is a risk factor for adverse medical outcomes and as well as increased risk for mortality. We know in pulmonary health, right, we even know from our own CF population as well as in transplant recipients that depression is increased risk factor for worse outcomes and increased mortality. We also know that it is an additional uh, risk factor for uh, actually cardiovascular disease. For example, you know, patients who have depression after MI uh, you know, twice as likely, for example, you know, to die as opposed to those who do not have depression. So it's an additional risk factor for adverse outcomes. We also know that depression can be a precursor to cognitive disorders such as dementia, right? So how are we going to see potentially increased risk of cognitive disorders in our patients? I think that's an interesting question. And it also affects mortality. So how will the rates of depression and anxiety evolve and how are they going to continue to affect some of the adverse medical outcomes and mortality in our patients. And there also might be now, as our patients age, additional risk factors for depression. Loneliness, right? We know that in general, loneliness is something that we talk more and more in aging populations. As our patients age, this is something that, that they, they also will address more and more. So this might be an additional risk factor for their depression. 
pain, right? As they, it was osteoporosis and other pains, right? Pain is a risk factor for depression as well. And it also changes the perception of depression. Vascular risk factors, right? As they age, right? The my, my, you know, and with their microvascular diseases, how are those vascular risk factors now change the incidence of depression? Increased degree of neuroinflammation. One of the pathophysiology for depression is the inflammation, right? And of course, with infections and inflammatory response in the body, it affects the brain, and that might be a risk factor for them developing depression as well as ADHD, which is also seems to be more common in our patient population. So we will see how trichafta changes potentially this risk factor. Uh, and then in addition to major depressive episodes, patients just might have higher rates in older patients of dysthymia or minor depression. So these are patients who do not meet full criteria for major depressive episodes, but they have some minor symptoms and they're more persistent. So they also affect the quality of life and can really de decrease it. And then grief and loss that come that is part of life and comes with life and aging can also then trigger a depressive episode. So these are just additional risk factors that we will need to be thinking more and more about. Okay. And in addition to mood symptoms, right, that of course we all know prevalent in depression, all the patients in general are more preoccupied with their kind of somatic bodily functions, right? They might present in general with things like constipation, pain, insomnia, and fatigue, and be more in tune to those symptoms. And of course, you know, given that patients with CF already have a lot of those symptoms, it will be interesting to see how we will be able to attribute those symptoms to their underlying CF versus depression. They might have more diffuse and vague complaints. With depression in the elderly, there might be more weight loss, ruminations, difficulty making decisions, and marked negativity, sort of an isolation, you know, worsening that loneliness, which is again a risk factor for depression in the first place. In general, all the people with depression are more preoccupied with finances, cognitive changes, and of course, these are actually real developments that also happen as well as our, when our patients with CF do age, and loss of functioning. And all the patients with depression, in general, they are more demobilized by their depression, and they do have more profound loss of functioning. So I think as our patients age and we diagnose depression in them, it actually might be affecting their functioning and having a more significant even effect on the overall quality of life. And now I think we'll be more and more concerned about cognitive changes and cognitive decline. And this is not the area where we, you know, we, that we studied as much, so, you know, as of yet. Um, and I, I'm sure all of us right here are now new complaints about the cognitive uh, complaints coming from our patients. Are there the effects of inflammation? Because in psychiatry, we just now blame inflammation on any psychiatric diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Neurodegenerative diseases, right, that we kind of, that we do see, right? We see more in Alzheimer's disease, right? Which just, that obviously age is a risk factor, right? So as our patients age, we will see more Alzheimer's disease, more Parkinson's disease, more other type of dementias. Those patients who go on to have transplant, right, of course are exposed to immunosuppressants, and of course lung transplant recipients have the higher risk of immunosuppressants, and immunosuppressants do have neurotoxic side effects. So those patients do frequently have cognitive changes, so we might see more of that as well. And then just the burden of multiple disease processes and multiple medications, right, and kind of how they affect the brain, especially those who do cross the blood-brain barrier. I think one of the slides on tobramycin actually was very interesting because you know we have one patient who does have a loss of balance uh, due to tobramycin, and what he do, and kind of what this what this person does with his work is actually is really dependent on balance. So this was, was a very particular interesting case where this particular side effect was very impairing to to this person's quality of life and worsening their depression. So this is also kind of another comorbidity that we will see more and more emerging, right? How the side effects now affect their functioning, right, the quality of love life, and affect their depression as well. And then, of course, with progressive lung disease, right, and potentially more hypoxia, that can also will contribute to more cognitive changes as well. So what, what can we do about this, right? Of course, we're going to continue to assess our patients with PHQ-9 or MGAT-7 and multiple, you know, potentially other tools that might come along the way. 
And I think especially with our older patients who've never had depression before, they do have a new depressive episode. I mean, I think we really need to question what is triggering this, right? In older patients, we do always want to think about new vascular etiologies, right? Or new psychosocial stressors, right? I mean, I, we always do this, right? Of course, we always ask, why is this person depressed? What's going on with life, in their life? But we want to query this even more in terms of the psychosocial and vascular risk factors. We might consider additional neuro workup, right? We might kind of really think about doing MOCA or mini mental status exam, or maybe send off our patients to neuropsychiatric testing when they come to our clinics and now they complain about cognitive changes because it can help us understand cognitive changes can also come with depression versus is there really an underlying, you know, some cognitive decline, progressive neurodegenerative disease? And we might to, you know, screen them for reversible causes of cognitive decline or maybe even ask for brain imaging, collaborate more with neuropsychiatry and neurology. So I think we'll be developing new collaborations and we'll be inviting additional members to our already multidisciplinary teams, such as neurologists. Okay. All right. And just to finish my part, so these are just some patients that stand out for me where this really, you know, aging takes on a new meaning. So one of these uh, examples is a six-year-old woman with cystic fibrosis who is living with increasing comorbidities and increasing side effects of prior treatments. And, you know, her lung function is actually not too bad, around 50%. Uh, but really, her major comorbidity at this point is the steroid-induced myopathy. Right, and, and that's a very debilitating condition for her, and sort of she needed to have multiple courses of steroids for her kind of for inflammatory processes. And now living in assisted living setting, worrying about the finances, having you, you know the you know having the daughter who has moved away, and really dealing with that loneliness, financial concerns, thinking about how long do I have to live for, how much money can I spend right now and really navigating multiple medication, treatment teams, appointments, and, and struggling with her overall quality of life. So, and, and she's resilient, and we, you know, we're working on sort of making the most out of every day, and very, she's very inspiring, but this is sort of, there's definitely all of what we talked about, you know, kind of seeing this in one person, it's, it's definitely heartbreaking. And the other example is a 63-year-old a man with cystic fibrosis who is also diagnosed with a progressive neurodegenerative condition. Prior to that diagnosis, the team was actually considering referring this person to a lung tran uh, transplantation. But now, due to the underlying neurodegenerative condition, it's, a, it's kind of a Parkinson's type of condition, the person is no longer a candidate. And it's very interesting to see how Parkinson's disease and CF actually influence each other, right? So now this is, this is the person who is, is, is um, really looking at the end of life. And now these are the conversations that we are having in CF clinics. So living with two major conditions and preparing for end of life. But also this notion of, you know, kind of, oh my goodness, I've already have one sort of like rare condition, CF, and now I have another. So this, it's really just sometimes hard to comprehend. That, my goodness, I'm, that's great. Um, so, so I think this is such an, obviously an important discussion and we will, continue to take care more and more of our aging patients. And I will pass on now to Leslie. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, my name is Leslie Miller. I am the uh, clinical social worker and mental health coordinator for the UAB Adult Center. And I'm talking today about grief uh, and what we can do to help our patients with that. So I kind of wanted to start with a couple of images of grief. Um, these are the ones that we know um, in terms of the stages of grief, acceptance, denial, bargaining, anger, depression. Um, I chose these particular images because they really illustrate um, that grief is kind of messy uh, it's, uh, it, it doesn't always happen in a particular order. Um, sometimes it, uh, it repeats itself or it goes in multiple directions. Um, there's just not one way to grieve. Uh, and I just think that's really important for us to remember. This is such a heavy topic that I thought it might be uh, a little fun to share one of my favorite comics. Uh, <laughs> 
So um, it says, I go through the four stages of grief every time I have to get out of bed. And he says, don't you mean five stages? No, I never accept it. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> We have multiple types of grief. Um, a lot of times when we think about grief, we, um, we hear somebody say that they're grieving, we just assume that someone has died, and there are just a lot of other ways that um, the stages of grief or cycles of grief happen. Um, and these are just some examples. Uh, <clears throat> we have, you know, our patients have CF, um, whether that's something that they've known about their whole life or maybe patients that we're seeing that are older that are getting newly diagnosed. Uh, grief and, um, and chronic illness kind of brings about some different things. Um, <clears throat> when we're looking at a chronic illness and grief, it's a little bit harder to to see that denial stage. Uh, we might see it very briefly, but when we're talking about somebody with CF who has treatments, there's a nebulizer in the room or uh, other DME equipment, medications that they're taking, it's a little bit harder to be like, oh, I don't have CF today. Um, and uh, so, so those things bring about daily reminders, frequent reminders that they come up that remind you that you have a chronic illness. Uh, it's not a one-time event. It's not something that you just deal with once um, in terms of uh, you know, other situations like a divorce or uh, things, loss of a pet, things like that. Um, there are cycles, there are flares, there are times that you might be stable and not deal with the grief of your chronic illness and then other times that you, know, uh, that you do where you might be hospitalized or feel sick. Um, and then you have the addition of those other losses that happen at the same time as your chronic illness. So you might be dealing with divorce or loss of a job or those other things at the same time, which make it um, a little bit more challenging to manage your illness and that can lead to, to more, Ill, um, more sickness. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, Dr. Jennifer Martin's uh, chronic stages of, of grief um, for chronic disease. Uh, she uh, discovered that she um, felt like her patients were having some extra stages, sort of. Um, so you can see here that some of these are, are familiar that we've already talked about. Um, but she felt like there were two that kind of come before that ac acceptance stage. Uh, loss of self and confusion. So that thought that... Um, who am I now, now that I have this chronic illness? Um, what do I do now with my life? Feeling very confused about what you thought your life was going to look like, and, and now it's changed. Uh, and then the reevaluation re of your life roles and goals. Um, so maybe you have to change course. Maybe you need to change careers because you can't do the same thing you used to be able to do. And trying to figure out how to do that and what your new goals are for your life um, before shifting into some form of acceptance. Um, she also talked about the fact that um, there are adaptations or integrations that happen that make more sense for people with chronic illness than ex the word acceptance. She didn't really like that word. Um, she felt like integrating the chronic illness into the life made more sense in terms of the cycles of grief that people with chronic illness go through. Uh, and some of the things that she felt like were helpful uh, in ways to help manage this were things like um, making the patient aware of, um, of the process, educating them on how grief, um, the cycles of grief, what that looks like, the stages, and then really encouraging them to kind of self-monitor, figure out where they are in those stages, which ones they have been go have already gone through, which ones they might go through later, um, to kind of figure out how they are, have been coping with it, um, helping them manage their illness while coping with their grief, and what those things may look like. Stress management, uh, self-monitoring, so kind of keeping a health diary about what you've been going through each day, um, making sure they're communicating with, um, with their team, with their loved ones, and that they have a good support system. Uh, and then, you know, what else? Um, we're looking at, you know, trying to tell our patients that they have permission to grieve, that it's okay that they're still grieving, whether that happens to be 
um, about their chronic illness or anything else that they're dealing with, uh, normalizing it for them, um, encouraging them to go to therapy and to, to talk about their, um, their experiences so that they can help manage that and um, make sure that they remain as healthy as they can. There was also another stage that, was, um, that came up in around 2019. David Kessler um, published a book called Finding Meaning. Um, he, he added that uh, to the five stages that we already know about. Um, and I will leave that to Dr. O'Hare to tell us more about. Um, so it's a good segue for her. <laughs> Thank you. You should be the chair. Good segue. That's a great segue. Okay, how do I control it? Just click on the arrows. Oh, really gotcha. Good. Yep, thank you. Okay. Hi, great to see you all. Um, I'm Virginia O'Hare, and I'm going to be talking with you all about finding meaning and purpose in aging with CF. Uh-oh, it didn't work. Oh, it still didn't work. What am I doing wrong? Oh, okay, good. So um, I've, I'm very grateful to have two relationships to, dis to disclose. First of all, I'm very grateful to the Boomer Esiason Foundation for giving us a large research grant um, for our three-year ActiCF multi-site randomized control trial. One of the sites is Chris's site, University of Augusta. Um, and I'm also really grateful to the letter team um, which was a small CF research pod um, who gave me an honorarium for work with CF and body image. So I've included the back together slide because I kind of had a hard time getting it through my head that I was actually going to be here talking with you all like this in person. So shortly before we were to upload our slides, I had written to Chris saying, do you want to see my video before I upload it? And he was like, uh you're not giving a video, you're giving a real talk, like back in the before times with actual live humans. So I'm just delighted to be here and to see like friendly faces and to get the adrenaline of the crowd. Excellent. Why am I having a hard time with this? This? No? This? Chris, what the hell's wrong with me? That? Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. <laughs> So what we're going to talk about is um, kind of how to actually gather information about aging with CF, including accessing some unconventional sources, some common themes from our team's clinical work, two detailed case examples, and within those case examples, some practical strategies that my hope is you could take home to use with your own patients to help them navigate aging with CF and living longer lives than ever before. So first of all, how to find out about aging with CF? We've had to rely a lot on more kind of patient-centered resources like um, CF member blogs. Um, there's, I rely quite heavily on a Trikafta subreddit for looking at all sorts of symptoms that might not have made it into like, mainstream media yet. Um, colleagues in CF mental health. Um, and patient experiences. So I think this is kind of cool where like patients are really driving a lot of the you know, clinical work that we're doing um, in finding out information about aging. And some common themes that come up, I know that these have been mentioned by um, some of the other speakers on our panel, are survivor's guilt. So most of the people that I know in my own life or that I've worked with clinically who have CF know at least one, if not several other people with CF who have already died. So there's survivor's guilt there. Um, lack of financial planning, which I know we've heard all about. Um, lack of educational or job or trade planning. Other health concerns, which we've also heard about, like diabetes, obesity, et cetera. Um, having to fully change their relationship to food. Um, so I've heard a lot about this kind of feeling like a hunger that just can't be satiated from the new um, modulators and kind of going from having to eat you know, thousands of calories a day just to stay alive, to now having to you know, watch their weight. Confusing timing with COVID. So think about the intersection between Trikafta coming out and then COVID. So for some things, you know, okay, great, we've reclaimed all this time and we've got longer life expectancy, don't have to spend as much time per day on treatments. And at the same time, it's COVID. So you know, for some things, especially in early COVID, where we weren't sure how folks with CF were going to you know, react with COVID. Um, so feeling kind of 
more freedom on the one hand from these amazing medical breakthroughs coupled with much less freedom due to COVID. And then lots of regrets, and uh, we'll hear those ac across our, the two cases I talk about. Like, if only I'd known Trikafta was going to come. Um, and sometimes more time isn't better. I know that that's a bit of a controversial thought, so keep that in mind as we meet our cases. And then this thought about starting the clock anew, like what does the future hold? And concerns about long-term effects of modulators. So here's our first case, 45-year-old married Caucasian mom of two teenage daughters diagnosed with CF in childhood. And she was referred to me um, years ago for my initial act with CF pilot study. Um, so I guess it's, and she, she stayed on as a long-term patient of mine for about six years to address depression, anxiety, OCD, and PTSD, mostly PTSD due to medical traumas. She was trained as a nurse, but left the field in her mid-20s in order to devote all of her efforts to being a mom. So her quote here is, I didn't think I'd have a lot of time with my girls, so I felt the need not to miss any of it. And now her kids are going off to college, and you know, what's she gonna do? And she really misses her nursing career and like busy days helping other people. She turned down the opportunity to participate in a clinical trial several years ago um, due to poor health and also due to having to travel. And I think that this trial was taking place in Denver and it just all felt like a lot too much. And because of this, this lady has harbored a lot of guilt about the fact that her mutation, which is very rare, wasn't included in the original label for Trikafta because, and she says, if only I participated in this trial, my mutation would be included, and those people in the world who have my mutation would now have access to this treatment like I do. So this really weighed hard on her. Um, and then also, her marriage had kind of run cold and distant and critical. So she'd had a lot of regrets. If only I knew Trikafta was coming. If I knew Trikafta was coming, I could have stayed on as a nurse. Or, you know, maybe I'd have thought about exploring different options other than staying in this marriage. And having just this guilt and shame and anxiety about not cherishing every moment about not being happy all the time, about not being fully gleeful, about having this whole second chapter of her life due to Trikafta. So what helped? So first is revisiting values. And those of you who've heard talks of mine before know I'm, I'm all about values. What do you want to stand for? What do you want to be about? If you do really only have this one life, then how do you want to live it? What do you want to do? What do you want to be about? And so for this lady, she actually had no trouble connecting with her values. And there's a bunch of different ways we can do that. You could do values card sort. Um, you could go dark. What do you want chiseled on your tombstone? Or you could go a bit lighter. What do you want people to say about you at your 70th birthday party? And so she came up with quite a bunch. Making a lasting contribution, being emotionally present for her daughters, growing friendships, particularly with her best friend and with her sister, um, in which she could be emotionally intimate. And partly to kind of make up for the fact that she didn't feel that there was a lot of emotional intimacy in her marriage. And then the next step was incur encouraging committed action in the service of these values. So, for example, um, she loved her work as a nurse and she was able to go back to school, part, uh, go back to work part time as a school nurse. And then encouraging making a repair. So this is a strategy stolen from dialectical behavior therapy, or DBT. This idea that if guilt is warranted, if you really have done something that you're feeling guilty about, or even if you're still feeling kind of haunted by something, can you make a repair? So she felt a lot of guilt about not being part of this clinical trial. So what could she do as a repair? Um, she did a lot of blogging, raising money, um, participating in other trials. And then self-compassion for all that she's been through. Self-compassion for her younger self and the sacrifices that her younger self made with the information that we had at that time. And for her current situation, like her marital stressors, empty nest, all of that. Being present with emotions so that there was no need to kind of distract from the grief she was feeling with, you know, thoughts of self-punishment, et cetera 
radical acceptance, another friend from dialectical behavior therapy, which is like wholehearted acceptance of the current situation. It's not condoning it. It's not saying I like it or this is right or this is just. Radical acceptance is it is what it is. This is what's here now. How can I fully accept this? Paired with willingness to kind of keep turning her mind again and again towards building a life that's worth showing up for. And then, as illustrated by this uh, San Sebastiano painting, um, acceptance of pain. So this is kind of a Zen concept that pain is a regular part of life. Pain's going to happen. There's going to be pain associated with grief, like we just heard about, associated with all sorts. And then we as humans have this amazing capacity to be able to take the initial pain, which we think of as kind of the first arrow, and add multiple other arrows. So there could be an arrow. So first there's the arrow of pain. I am sad that I didn't participate in that study. I feel guilty that I didn't participate in that study. Or there's pain that my marriage today is how it is. And then there's the second arrow of I should have done this. If only I had acted differently, I wouldn't be where I am now. Um, I'm a terrible person because I didn't do that study. I deserve bad things because I didn't do that study. And each of those are kind of second, third, fourth, fifth arrows. So if you can sit with that initial feeling of pain, then the idea is you won't need these other arrows that create more suffering. So we did a lot of mindfulness of pain, being present with what is. Oop. Okay. Oh, we're not doing questions. All right. So that's case one. Kind of a success. Case two, unfortunately, not so much. So this was, this is possibly my favorite person I've ever worked with, which I know as a clinician we shouldn't have favorites, but come on. <laughs> so this is a 39-year-old single Caucasian man diagnosed with CF in childhood. And he was also referred to me from my active with CF pilot study. I only kept two long-term patients from that study, which was years and years ago. And the first was the first lady we heard about, and the second was this guy. So he's been a, he had been a patient of mine for eight years to address PTSD, both due to horrible medical procedures and also due to just childhood abuse and trauma, depression, anxiety, OCD, and trichotillomania. He had some suicidal ideation, like sort of a passive wish to be dead, um, particularly during major CF exacerbations. So his medical history is significant for the fact that he had a pneumothorax maybe six years ago and never regained lung function in that lung. So he would talk a lot about like he only has one lung, one good lung. Um, and then he also developed very difficult to manage diabetes, plus unsteady gait, neuropathy. And he had been on disability forever. And his plan, his kind of bargaining, if you think about the stages of grief, was he was determined to, he kind of signed up for staying alive until he was 40, right? And he'd grown up thinking, you know, I'm going to be dead by 40. Um, so he didn't have a job, didn't go to college, didn't have a partner. He never dated other than way back in high school. And he was living with his mom and stepdad, didn't get along with them, rarely leaving his bedroom, all day video game and getting high on inhaled cannabis. And he'd sort of thought, all right, this is it. This is how I'm going to sort of fester along until I'm 40, and then I'll die of my natural death from CF. And he would say repeatedly, I didn't go to college, I didn't get a job, I didn't save for retirement, I didn't date. I didn't build any kind of life because I was supposed to be dead by 30. And over years of therapy together, the lasting impact of the marked trauma that he'd had, both medical and you know, childhood emotional trauma, physical trauma, became increasingly apparent. He was also very impacted by COVID. So he um, took the you know, isolation precautions very seriously. He was very, very worried about contracting COVID, frequently saying, you know, I've only got one good lung. I can't get COVID. Um, and he only had two close friends in life. And both of them were you know, guys in their 30s who were kind of living their regular lives during COVID and didn't really get why he couldn't come out with them. So he became somewhat estranged from them. In addition, diabetes and increasing weight gain become, became much more of an issue. 
He tried a bunch of different, like insulin sensors, putting them in different locations. You know, nothing seemed to work. You know, in his stomach, they would like get in with like his pant belt and back of his arm. It was kind of driving him crazy, and just like there didn't seem to be a good spot for these sensors. Um, it was also really hard for him to kind of unlearn prior eating habits. So he was the guy who, you know, his doctors had told him, have a milkshake after dinner each night, have ice cream with every meal just to maintain weight. And it was really hard for him to unlearn these once he was on Trikafta. So what helped? Um, so revisiting values, again, what do you want to be about? For him, it was really hard to identify values. Um, he had some sort of glimmers of, um, he, he got a cat, he really wanted to be a great cat dad, that was probably his main value. Um, he loved playing music, um, he created an album of like his own, like, you know, original music, um, which was freaking amazing and kind of like a modern day kinks. Uh, he wrote a ton of really great screenplays that were hilarious and it was kind of an amazing genre of like scary and funny at once. And then he really had, he had these aspirational values of being a kind partner um, and maybe being a stepdad. That said, when it came to committed action, we tried everything. So I tried getting him on online dating sites. You know, it would take months for him to like download the site. And then he would write a blurb that was just terrible. He'd say, you know, um, I like movies. They're like babies and new ones coming out every month. I'm like, no, don't put that on your dating site. <laughs> So just kind of nothing was really clicking. And then every now and then, despite all of this, he would, I mean, there's someone for everyone, right? He would get a bunch of hits on this dating site, but then never follow through. Um, and he was able to create a full-time schedule for screenwriting. So instead of sitting home and getting high every day, he would move that into kind of a more nighttime schedule. And we got him off, we got him a prescription for medical cannabis. We got him off inhaled onto tinctures. So saving lung function, great. Um, so he'd, every day he would do screenwriting all day. He, with COVID, there were a bunch of online screenwriting classes that he was able to enroll in. Um, he did start online dating, but that never really came to anything. He got a cat harness to take his cat for walks. Um, and then we were really encouraging changing his environment in order to improve his mood. So looking into like moving out of his parents' home where he didn't feel welcome. But regardless of all of these interventions in my arsenal, such as ACT, DBT, radically open DBT, which is for over control, cognitive behavioral therapy, the stance that prevailed that he would say again and again is, I only agreed to do this for 30 years. I was supposed to be dead by 30. I didn't make a life because I, was I wasn't supposed to live past 30. So social isolation remained due to COVID, anxiety, depression, despite all of our efforts. His trauma was never adequately addressed. He would kind of be willing to touch it a bit, but then no, nope, don't want to do it, can't do it. Re-traumatization happened near daily because he was living with his family of origin who he didn't get along with. And moving out just seemed impossible due to lack of funds, COVID, et cetera. So Andrew died by suicide in March and he overdosed on his insulin and there was no way to see it coming. He left a letter expressing an abundance of anger towards his family of origin. And in that letter, he called out that I was the only person in his life. Yeah, I miss him every day. I think about him always. And particularly given that the last couple of years, we'd kind of given up on therapy. Therapy wasn't working. We just talked video games. We talked movies. We talked about, like, political stuff. Like, he, was, he was a buddy of mine. So how can we do our best to prevent this tragic outcome from happening? You know, and this is something people aren't talking about, right? Oh, more time, great. But what about those for whom more time isn't better? And just really the imperative nature of addressing trauma, whether it's medical trauma, childhood trauma, intersections of these traumas, cultivating meaning in life, really putting an emphasis on building a social network particularly given COVID-related isolation. Financial support um, to allow for kind of catch-up, like re-education, retirement savings, learning a new trade, targeting mental health efforts towards adjustment to much longer life than originally planned, and don't assume that more is better. It might require some grieving of loss, of loss of an identity of a, being a terminal patient. 
and addressing survivor's guilt and continuing to prioritize research into aging with CF. Now, final slide is a last call for our study, which is not geared at all towards aging with CF. However, it's geared entirely towards making meaning in your life. What do you want to be about? How can you live your best life? So this has been a three-year multi-site study that's ending in the spring. So hopefully, by next year, I'm reporting on all of our amazing data. But recruitment is closing soon. And we're taking all comers over 18 with CF as long as they score something on like PHQ-9 or GAD-7. Um, email Chelsea Nurse, she's right here, um, to enroll or for more information. And yeah, we're really hopeful that this a sort of side effect of this study will also be helping people to cultivate a life that's worth showing up for. Thank you. All right, so now we have time for Q&A. Um, I want to invite the panelists to come back up here. We don't have any handheld mics because COVID. So, um, so if you can come back up here, otherwise you'll be doing a lot of laps up and down from the stage to answer questions. So we invite you to go ahead and put all your questions in the chat. We have several already. We're going to try and take the favorites first. Sure. You guys, go ahead. And sit at the table if you want. <laughs> Stay. Okay, so I'm just going to open this up to anybody on the panel who wants to answer. Would the experience of managing CF from childhood be considered a protective factor as we age? Meaning, are they more in tune with their overall health and have long established relationship with care teams? So, any thoughts on that? I mean, it's possible to answer that by an analogy to patients that progress from CF to CF with transplant. That at least a typical comment that I hear from my transplant colleagues are that the CF patient population seems to do better because they're really accustomed to taking care of really complex illnesses. And although it changes from pre-transplant to the typical treatment of lung disease with CF to the post-transplant, but they're really well adapted to that. So if we can extrapolate further to that as people age and need medicine for hypercholesteremia, blood pressure, things like that, I would hope that many would have the same habits that helped those who went on to transplant. It would also help them manage the problems of aging that require complex medical care. Yeah, I definitely would agree with that comment and also add as, you know, both we've seen, with, we see with transplant also track, out, track after and, you know, new, right, new medicines and breakthroughs that will come through and there will also be periods of adjustment, right? I think also patients, you know, who go through the transplant, there's a p time period where they have to let go of their sort of CF body, right, and CF treatments and adjust to new team and new treatments. And now we're seeing that with Strikafta as well. So there will be these periods of adjustments that might be really difficult, but eventually I think those skills will prevail. And also we've seen that with COVID, right? And we know that patients with CF have, you know, have been excellent taking care of themselves during the COVID as well. So I think this is a really relevant question at this time. Now that we're a few years into the introduction of Trikafta, what kind of conversations do we need to have with patients to reduce or prevent survivor's guilt? When should we start those conversations? Or should we start those conversations? So, Leslie? I think 
we need to let our patients uh, lead with that and kind of meet them where they are. Uh, Any time is a good time to have that conversation. It's definitely not a topic we should avoid. We should encourage um, our patients to, to talk about um, the people that they love that they lost so that we can kind of assess where they are in that grief process so we can help move them along if that's what's needed and maybe help them find some meaning in that person's um, death uh, so that that kind of helps them finalize that grief process a little bit more. Dr. O'Hare, did you want to yeah. add? Yeah, I, I agree. I think, I do think it's on us to bring, to at least put the topic on the table. I've never put the topic on the table and have someone say, yeah, no, um, or be offended. But usually when I put the topic on the table, people seem relieved. Oh yeah, you, you're sort of in the know. You know what this is about. Yes, I want to talk about it. That said, left to, if I don't bring it up, if I forget or other, I don't feel like it's something that patients do often bring up, often because there can be so much shame associated with survivor's guilt and shame about this whole, like, not cherishing every moment. That's something that I hear a lot. So, yeah, I, I would encourage people to bring it up. For pediatric patients, how are we addressing grief that their parents or caregivers also have, and how do we train them to know the signs of grief with their kids? So... Sorry, we may want to play musical chairs and come up, come, geez, come up to the mic because uh, Does this, one not work? this one's not really working. I was hoping there was an engineer out there, but there's not. So we may want to come up to the podiums. Is that correct in the audience? Okay, all right. Okay, who'd like to come up to the podium? So we don't have a lot of people up here who work with kids. So I'm not sure we have a great answer to that. Um, I think it's one of the things that's really important, I'll just answer from my own practice, is as kids transition, I think that's a really important question to ask around how are the parents doing, where are they at in terms of individuating with their children, understanding some of the traumas and the things that have happened to children when they're young, that that conversation between both the pediatric CF teams and the adult CF teams are really, really critically important to be able to help us with that. And I think that loss is such an integral part of life that conversations around grief and how you recognize that in your children should start at a really young age. There's all kinds of loss. So many children experience things outside of CF, divorce, they move. They lose friends. They lose pets. So helping parents know how to just talk about those typical life events and what grief looks like helps to prepare them for grief that's related to a chronic illness as well. Sorry, technology is not as always as lovely as we'd like. Depression and aging with chronic illness, since most of the screening questionnaires for depression overlap strongly with symptoms of illness, such as sleep, diet, etc. Does anyone have any suggestions for better screening that separate those issues? Also, given the shortage of therapists we are seeing, is there an ethical dilemma when we know someone is depressed but we're not able to get them into treatment? There are definitely, you know, better screenings for geriatric patients, but also geriatricians when they would administer things like PHQ-9, right? There's always a question in medical patients to exclude those symptoms because they do overlap or to include them. And usually, even if you use PHQ-9, it's better to overdiagnose, right, and to include those symptoms. So I think if you have PHQ-9 and if the patient also says that they are, right, depressed and they're not enjoying things, and in addition, they... Right, they report insomnia, fatigue, and let's say change in appetite. I would count that as, as depression. So we'd rather to overestimate than underestimate. And usually in elderly, in older patients, those symptoms will overlap, and there will be contribution from both depression and the underlying medical conditions such as CF. And you know, we do have a shortage, but I think even identifying and sometimes even just naming, that's an intervention of its own. So even if we cannot provide therapy, 
in, in, in the clinic, although there's definitely, you know, we heard about ACT, and, you know, we're also doing the, you know, kind of yesterday we had a course on implementation of CFCBT, so I think there are increasing resources. But even just having a discussion and addressing and naming and validating, that's already an intervention. And then, and then you, you know, checking in, right? Hopefully, maybe connecting to some resources. But I think, again, naming and validations, that's, that's the first step, and that's intervention of its own, that we care. We know about this, and we care, and let's, let's do something about it. So I have a bit of a controversial answer. I'm a bit anti-PHQ-9 and GAD-7 because I feel like they're so overused that everyone just circles the zeros. So we, our team, including Chris and Chelsea, have developed a CF mental health and wellness questionnaire that we're piloting during this three-year study. So hopefully by this time next conference, we'll have some good psychometric data about this questionnaire, which is asking much more specifically about CF symptoms and about impact of CF, including aging with CF. So stay tuned. Also, I've been asked to answer a question about, is this study open to Canadians? So I'm Canadian, and it breaks my heart to say currently no. And the reason is a bit silly. So even though we're kind of testing out two treatments, given that it's still considered therapy, we aren't able to offer this outside of the US. That said, hopefully it's a go, and people love this treatment, and it has good data, in which case we're happy to train any Canadians in this protocol. So this is a real quick one. Karen, there was a question about is the Compass resource available to people outside the US? That is a great question. Compass case managers do take occasional inquiries um, internationally, and we actually have a number of case managers who are fluent in Spanish. Um, and utilize the language line. What I can say is that the resources that Compass case managers frequently refer to are typically US-based. Um, so there may or may not be a, a, an applicable referral for somebody who is calling um, internationally. So the next question, are there any upcoming studies planned examining the effects of long-term HEMT use, particularly with ETI cohorts on inflammation and potential progression for coronary artery disease? So I'm not aware of any. Um, the only uh, area that I am familiar with is that they are looking at GI inflammation. Uh, pre and post um, modulator therapy. I am not familiar with the results, but I believe very early has shown a de decrease, but I can't quote you the exact papers with them. Whether that will translate into coronary disease, which has a relationship to inflammation, I don't know if there's anything going on. If there's anyone in the audience who wants to text something in, I'd be glad to, we'd be glad to share that. Okay, here's a challenge for you all because Chris said he's not sure any of you can answer this. <laughs> Given the health benefits of Trikafta to many, is it reasonable to consider individuals living with CF to spend time with one another safely in efforts to provide a support community? Does Trikafta change any of this? I was right. <laughs> So it's about contract precautions. Right, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the reason to keep people separated who have CF is to sharing organisms. And I don't think we have anywhere near enough information about acquisition of uh, from person to person that this will change with Trikafta substantially. It probably will be reduced, but whether it will get to a low, low enough level that we can recommend that people do get together. I think we're not, we're certainly not there yet. What the future will hold, I, I don't know. Did you all have anything to add? <laughs> what do you think about including discussion of current life expectancy and discussion with parents of newly diagnosed children? What are the poten potential benefits and consequences?
Uh, I think it's clear none of us work with peds. Uh, just, just, to, just to say that at first. Um, I think it's, it is an important conversation to have uh, with parents of young kids that are newly diagnosed so that they know that this is not just a death sentence. You, um, you can Google CF and, and see some nightmare situations and you want to have those realistic conversations with those parents about the possibility of a longer life expectancy, um, you know, depending on the potential challenges that child might have throughout um, their life. So I think it's an important conversation to have uh, regardless. No, I'm for the next one. <laughs> so I just want to add something to that. I think one of the things I've seen, and it's actually from a different pulmonary clinic, but whenever we give people averages, they lock onto that average number. So I think if you're going to choose to have these conversations, which I think are really important, it's important to include a conversation around averages and the fact that that's an average across a huge population of people. And it means that the life expectancy can be much greater than that. And it can also be less than that. And if we're not very thoughtful about that conversation, I think people leave with a specific number in mind. And that can have a lot of negative consequences down the line. So I just wanted to add that in there. Um, sorry, the questions keep changing. So this is for Dr. O'Hare. How did you deal with coming to terms, realizing that therapy was no longer working for Andrew and managing your own feelings of grief and any guilt or shame after he died? What was your self-care? I think that's a question we probably all would have. Oh, I, lo I love that question. So thank you to whoever asked that. This is also such a good opposite action for me. So I had huge shame because outside of this whole thing, I'm a suicide therapist, right? Like I'm initially trained in dialectical behavior therapy. 90% of my clinical work is with patients who are chronically suicidal. So yeah, the very first thing I did was um, write to my team, including Chris and say, and Chelsea, and say, opposite action, I'm letting you all know Andrew died by suicide. Partly just because I wanted, I knew, left to my own devices, I'm a Brit, I grew up with like, you don't need emotions, don't show emotions, don't have emotions. So I knew that left to my own devices, I just sort of turtle. Um, how did I deal with treatment not working? We sort of radically accepted treatment's not working, we'd wean down to maybe once every three weeks when he was coming in in person pre-COVID. And then with COVID, I had offered, you know, do you want to just meet weekly to have something, you know, to have like some sort of contact? And he'd said, yeah. So, you know, we do, I would try to get some interventions in here and there, but we also talked extensively about Sonic the Hedgehog and about, you know, latest movies and political stuff and whatever. So we, it really was much more of a social relationship than just a therapy relationship, which also really, I think, impacted my own grief as well. Um, I frequently go on the hike that, uh, there's a section of the hike where there's no um, cell service, which I refer to as Schrodinger's Andrew, because when I got into the part of the hike where there was cell service, I got his mom's call that he died. So I go there often and think about him. I'm also a tattoo person. I got a tattoo to honor him. Notice judgments if you think, oh, you know, you're a therapist. Should you be getting tattoos to honor your patients? Yes, you should. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know, I just, I think about him often. Um, I carry him with me. Um, if he were here today, he would think it's absurd that any of us care at all about his life, but I think he would be kind of touched. We know that sleep disturbances are common in CF and that sleep and anxiety strongly influence each other. Some data suggests these issues worsened with trikafta. Do we have any strategies for managing sleep problems and sleep-related anxiety in CF? Definitely our patients report, right, much more disturbance in their sleep and anxiety, and there's some reports also of increased anxiety with, you know, trichafta. Part of it might be, right, that uh, now our patients have obviously great lung capacity, right, great exogenation, right, sort of they have more energy, they don't need as much sleep. So there might be also just perceived lack of sleep, right, so I don't need 12 or 10 hours as much, right, my body's just not sleeping as much, so that the 
seven or eight hours seem like insomnia. We also know that uh, you know the CFCR um, gene is also expressed in the brain, and and part of the brain that it's expressing is actually kind of one of the sleep centers. So it's somehow is trichafter affecting that? That's a question. But the best, and then you know, definitely lack of sleep can lead to worsened anxiety, right? If somebody truly does not get enough sleep and they have insomnia, that definitely decreases their overall resilience throughout the day. The best treatment for sleep, I, I actually, the best treatments for sleep are the behavioral interventions, right? So, for example, right, CBT for sleep, for insomnia is really the best intervention. But all of us, you know, we can kind of, you know, really teach our patients behavioral hygiene because insomnia is a learned behavior, right? Any of us who don't have problems with insomnia, right, you put your, you know, your pillow, uh, you you will your head on your pillow, right? And there's an association, right? You've learned that you, you, you lie down, you're tired enough, you fall asleep. So somebody who develops insomnia, they become very aware that, oh my gosh, I'm lying down, but I'm not falling asleep. I need to try to fall asleep. Why am I not falling asleep? And what happens is that actually norepinephrine, right, or adrenaline is being released, right? Because when you're trying to fall asleep, it's an activity, and you cannot be active when you're actually falling asleep, right? So that is awakening you, right? So thinking and obsessing about the sleep, oh my gosh, I'm not going to get enough sleep tomorrow, I'm going to be tired, that just prevents, right? So part of it is actually teaching our patients about that, right? It can be very helpful. That insomnia is a learned behavior, right? When you worry about falling asleep, that contributes to insomnia. And part of it is also radical acceptance. Okay, so I'm not sleeping. That's fine. I'm not going to sleep tonight well. That's fine. I'm just going to lie here and rest. Part of just acceptance of that, right, can release that anxiety. And part of it is also decreasing, right, part of the behavioral sleep hygiene, and I'm sure you all know this, right, the sort of decreasing amount of time that people spend in bed trying to fall asleep, right? So kind of getting sleepy somewhere else and then go to bed when they're tired but still wake up at the same time, right? So that, you know, behavioral sleep hygiene can be very helpful, referring them to, you know, CBT for insomnia and education. And then the anxiety about it will also decrease. And obviously we can continue to treat anxiety with, medications if need to, with lots of therapies that we have available. But I think really explaining to our patients how sleep and insomnia work can be very helpful. If you do want to. How do we help encourage and advocate our adult patients to obtain a PCP? As our patients age and face other age-related diagnoses, our care center has found a PCP to be important to help manage and refer to other specialties. Our patient says, my CF care team is my PCP. I mean, this is an ongoing problem and I'm gonna just amplify it <clears throat> by saying it's how do we get um, then referred to geriatricians as well, because that'll be an issue. Um, I have no easy, uh, e easy recommendation. If you're within a single institution, then being able to develop a relationship with a group of primary care provi providers and making sure there's a good understanding of who is going to help out with what. I mean, I, I've taken care of CF for a long time, we don't uh, keep as up-to-date as we should to vaccinations as adults, the other preventive care, and as I outline the good cardiac, cardiovascular health that's needed, those are guidelines that change periodically, and I would guess that the majority of, um, of individuals who are taking care of adults with CF are not up-to-date completely with it. Um, they sh you know, th that may change as the responsibility increases. But I don't have any uh, recommendation other than establishing relationships with people. So Karen, these are a couple for you. Is COMPAS seeing an uptick in concerns around the changes coming to the Vertex assistance programs? That's one. And do you think CF patients will ever be able to get life insurance? Those are hard-hitting questions. Um, so first question, yes. Um, the, uh, the CF Foundation and Compass are definitely in tune with the changes that are going on with the Vertex program, expressing some significant concerns about um, affordability for many people living with CF. 
I'll say that if you have a particular question um, or a particular case that you'd want to talk to, um, my policy and advocacy colleagues are at the booth um, and willing to have those kind of one-on-one -on -one conversations with you um, to talk further about details and, and strategies um, as well. And then with regard to life insurance, uh, so I mean, I, I am not a financial planner, so full disclosure there. Um, but you know, it, it's, um, it's going to be really interesting thinking about the resources that are available to people with CF um, that are specific to CF. You know, so within that landscape analysis, we did a lot of questions, came up about tools, again, about measuring these very personal experiences and perceptions of financial wellness. And sometimes they'd lump things like, you know, rent with medical expenses. And you realize that for a person living with CF, those need to fall in maybe completely separate buckets to be able to address. Um, so I don't know is the short answer to that question about life insurance, but we'll keep uh, exploring. So Virginia, this question is with your experience with ACT and DBT, um, particularly around diffusion, do you have any recommendations for working with people like your case example when they say 30 years is all I plan for? Yeah, definitely. And, and that is something we, we actually did defuse. So with defusion, you think about cognitive fusion is like um, rigid attachment to thoughts as truth. And defusion is a really cool act um, intervention where kind of imagine those, that like old school cartoon where you've got a bomb and a fuse that's lit. So defusion is like cutting that fuse before the bomb can go off. It's like breaking the association with that word or phrase. So somebody would, you know, like Andrew, would still have the neural network lit up of, I, I only agreed to live till I'm 30. But we can light up a different neural network by kind of saying that same sound bite with like silly voices, like a dog, like a cat. And we, you know, this is definitely one of the many things that we tried, you know, going back and forth. Like, I only agree to live till I'm 30. Ruff, ruff, I only agree to live till I'm 30. So that the next time he has that thought, sure, the original network is lit up, but then there's also this other one of like us kind of being funny about it. So yeah, we, we definitely played around with that, but ultimately no dice in this case, but in many other cases, it does seem that that can create a bit more fluidity. That said, I'd say even with Andrew, there was, you know, he only agreed to live till he was 30. And at the same time, he since being 30, he wrote, I think, 15 screenplays, he got a cat, he wrote a whole album. So I don't know, I feel like Diffusion might have helped a little bit. So Karen, or anyone, we struggle with Medicare due to cost, specifically regarding the loss of the ability to use copay cards. Health will only go so far. Patient assistance fund is closing. What else are you finding to help? Thanks for that question, because I think that really speaks to the slide we had about those, those questions that you need to be asking in advance, and you possibly being the person with CF, about what other alternatives are out there. So some of the examples, like the extra help program, Medicare savings programs, you know, I mean, these are income and resource based, but it's important to know whether or not you qualify for those. The other are um, a possible uh, changes to how you get Medicare, meaning are you going an Advantage plan with those, um, the perks of Advantage plans, the pros and cons there, are you able to purchase a Medigap plan? Um, you know, Medigap plans are not available to people under 65 in every state. So again, it's important to take those on a case-by-case -case basis. But it's really about understanding the breadth um, of resources available beyond just those specific copay programs or those strategies that got someone uh, through commercial insurance affordability. So this is our last question. Are typical screenings being recommended earlier for aging CF patients, colonoscopies, et cetera? So I'm going to combine that with one other one, which is um, are there other types of screening that we need to be looking into that will help us as people age? Yeah. The guidelines for colonoscopy screening are published, and I'm, uh, and they are they do start earlier for CF patients. I believe it's age forty. Yep, I got that right. 
um, age 40 rather than 50. And, uh, um, but if you are a transplant recipient, that also changes it as well. So there are guidelines. In fact, the CF Foundation has put a great effort on being able to try to keep their recommendations and guidelines for care up to date. And so there's a whole series of them that you can get off of the um, uh, CFF.org website with this. Um, I think there will be changes in what the recommendations are for nutrition. Uh, the guidelines that I've most recently seen are quite old, and this whole aspect of having increasing frequency of obesity and the possibilities of having to protect against cardiovascular disease as patients age, well, I think will come more to the front. I am not a member of that group to know how close they are to um, starting up a new guidelines uh, process, but I think that that would be from my, in my opinion, fairly high on the list. I mean, I, you know, we already have screening for depression, anxiety, whether the particular screeners will change is, is you know, might be a question, but, you know, we're already screening for that. And in terms of the cognitive screening, that sounds necessarily recommended. I mean, that's really something that you are concerned about, that just be more aware of that, that there are sort of simple screeners available, such as MOCO, minimal mental status examination, and MOCO is being a little bit potentially better. And then con you know, consider that, kind of put it on your radar, right? But that's not something that is actually kind of recommended, potentially, in any setting. Uh you know, Dr. O'Hara mentioned that she has a possibility of a, a different questionnaire coming out. There's a CF stress questionnaire that may be coming out. Uh, there's a study going on about that right now. Um, I, I think it's important to recognize that these these assessments are tools to have a conversation with our with our patients. They're they're not just like the end of like okay, I can diagnose this person with depression now, and that's that's it. We need to be having more discussion and conversation with them. Um, whether that's about um, memory or um, mood, sleep, there are assessments for that, um, loneliness. There, there are lots of things that, um, that we can assess for that really just help us have more conversations about their symptoms, about their experience, so that we can then help them more. So I just want to thank all of our speakers so much. I know I'm leaving here with several different areas that I feel like I can focus on. I want to thank you for all of your attention. It was really nice sitting up here and looking out in the audience and not seeing everybody on their phones, but actually <laughs> listening. So I can't tell you how good that makes us feel that this is a topic that's really important to people. So thanks for mu so much for joining us today and have a great rest of the conference. <laughs>